heaven be? The story is that you go to heaven once this body is over. And apparently, people who have done the research, that even at the speed of light, those souls would not be out of this galaxy yet. Where's heaven? Above, below, who knows? <coughs> so these things can be taken sort of concrete literal as that, that, that means true. as lies, but perhaps there's something <coughs> in the middle where a person, you, the people you work with, way of using the metaphor, the mythology, to transport one meaning into another. Something that's embodied. Something that helps a person change. Okay so far? Good. <clears throat> if you're not already, <clears throat> make yourselves comfortable. was very famous for teaching stories and the stories he started one of his reasons if you like why he started to do it was because he could work and help more people through doing stuff with an audience now I don't know how effective that was but there's an intention there for that man to teach those stories and just recently I, um, that's me it's not you Guilt by association. Um, he had a lot of sort of uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of students, and not all of them came to sort of prominence in the field of what they do. I've done training with three of them, four of them that have. You'll have heard these names: Grinda Bandler, um, Bill O'Hanlon, who's wonderful. Isn't he? Yeah. If you get a chance, train with Bill O'Hanlon. And recently, um, sort of the last two expensive trainings that I've done have been with Steve Gilligan who I highly recommend you do some work with if you're planning on making a career of this hypnosis help. Um, I've just got back from doing some training with Gilligan and that was, he's a wonderful storyteller. Um, I like him a lot. He was Ericsson's student for about eight years and he wasn't with them all the time, he would go off and do some work, etc. I highly recommend you do that if you get the chance and your, your wallet allows. He'll be in Carlisle next year, around sort of Christmas time. And I think that'll be somewhat cheaper because it won't be a residential. I went to Carlisle two years ago and I've just done that. Um, we're going to touch on little bits of Gilligan's work as we have been already on this course. Oh yeah, so he's a good storyteller and Eric's wanted to do all this stuff, how wonderful. So, take yourself comfortably. You can take notes if you want, I just allow what goes in to go in. Have you heard the story? You may not have done. Of the master architect. It's one of those archetypes that's quite prevalent if you read. And I encourage you to read because it's a way of learning and getting things to go inside just that little bit deeper. So it's a way of sort of broadening your own vistas, your horizons. And the master architect, very interesting, um, was kind of lecturing to a whole bunch of students. And some had turned up just a little bit late and were wondering what was going on and they had questions. And the premise of the master architect was in order to 
really free yourself and to be able to help others and of course to become master architects because why else would you be all of the students listen to a master architect is you've got to be willing to learn in any situation quite deeply and as long as you're willing to learn in any situation you'll start to be able to change in ways that you might not have had that ability before and he kind of likes to as Ericsson did tell stories where on earth is this going what's the point of this and that's when the master architect would kind of smile and have that like, deep intuition that you've all got and state because things that come in threes tend to go in deep enough as long as you're willing to learn and that's an act of intention you'll be able to do things in new ways one of his stories was you can train a pigeon and some of things what's this got to do with architecture you can train a pigeon through reward whether it's punishment or positive reward to play a certain set of notes on the piano just by walking along and giving it a grain of food when it gets a pattern right and this is positive reinforcement now I kind of think this is a lovely like, little tale so you've got this pigeon that will walk along a piano and maybe play the first few bars to chopsticks and again some are thinking well what's this got to do with learning architecture pigeons on pianos and he said well it's really easy if you then stop giving the pigeon the reward every time it does it something happens if it gets an intermittent reward because pigeons like people learn by contrast did you know that you can't have dark without light it's really interesting like you all get what metaphors are okay if you were to read or listen or hear someone take one of the paragraphs from the Egyptian Book of the Dead there's a really poignant line in it and it says I am t this is when someone's dead and they're about to go into the underworld a scary place or not depending on your beliefs and the person that's to be resurrected or Cyrus in this case will say I am yesterday today and tomorrow I have the power to be born a second time I am the power that informs all the gods now whether that's a metaphor or literal who could know so you've got this pigeon <coughs> dancing away that's positively reinforced but then the, the reward stops so it never knows what it's going to get that reward for and what happens with the pigeon is when it gets a reward it's done something different and it must in its tiny pigeon mind attribute some belief to that it does there's tests that proven so if the pigeon had for example just been cleaning its beak and had tapped beaks with another pigeon just before it got that reward for doing the it would then add that other little piece of information on and think this is how I get a reward scary stuff and then it would do that whole piece of piano again <coughs> tap beaks clean itself not get a reward go for a walk in a circle get a reward it would add the walk in a circle there's a psychological need pigeons and people but not all that need to attribute meaning or causality to what happens they make beliefs up that's interesting so sitting as many were still wondering some what's this got to do with architecture the master architecture said make yourselves comfortable enough to open up to a different type of learning you see just out those windows the architect said you'll see trees grass 
And even if you think about it, the building you're in was built with purpose. There's deep foundations that support a lot of stuff. And outside where those trees are, and the grasses, and there's other people. It's an interesting idea to know that I spoke to a woman recently, said the architect, who is a friend of mine. She's a librarian. Her job was to be a master, a keeper of books and information. And she had come to see me, said the master architect, to ask for some help. And the help was really interesting when I met her because she's an old friend. And I ended up going to visit her <coughs> at the place where she works. And you know what libraries are like. You just go inside, peruse, and maybe you have some intention in mind to get a certain book. Or perhaps you're just going inside to look around, not necessarily to learn something, not necessarily to learn, but because you want to discover more about a specific subject. Perhaps you're going in to do some research or to make some changes. And you know when you go into a lab, things are organized in different ways. So you can find what you need. And most libraries have many floors. Sometimes you can go up, you can go down. You can lose track of time as you move through the volumes and pages and pictures not necessarily of a person's life but it could be and as I sat down in her office said the architect she said to me you've been here before and he said yes many times and he noticed she was sitting comfortably now and that the breathing was a certain rate. And she said, yes, I'd like your help. First, I'd like to show you around the library again and point out that there's a lot of books that you can get lost in. There's a lot of volumes of descriptions and places you can find out about different countries just by looking. And as they walked off together she showed him new sections that he hadn't seen before. New additions. Some chronicling the future. Some the present. And a lot of history that wasn't personal. There's books on psychology, on cooking on car repair, on architecture, on healing. And there's books about books, meta lists that catalogue other things. There's books about health. And she pointed out a new edition, a map of the many floors places where rooms to go in 
where people can read quietly, can learn in a vast majority of ways, even places where children can go to color in and paint and draw and remember what it's like to play as a child. There's the histories of the dead, the chronicles of civilizations past. There's poetry that speaks to the soul. But above all, there's stories. And there's a big sign that says, quiet please, because everyone processes in different ways. Who would have known that? The story of Red Riding Hood and the wolf is a story about anything other than the wolf and a young girl. So having shown him around new places, old places, they both knew there was a lot more to this library than met the eye. Going back to her office, sat down and she said you know master architect I'm thinking it's time for me to leave it's time to move on because I've been a keeper of this library for a lot of years I've learned many things but now and you know what it's like to recognize a deep calling in yourself. Where it's time to change. Time to evolve, develop. Because something's waking up inside. And he nodded and said, okay. Here's what I suggest you do. It's to go to your upper room, that place where it's your sanctuary, where you have all of the memories, the photographs, the pains, the pleasures, the joys, the pains. And in your own attic, as it were, to begin to sort things out for yourself. And you can do it consciously and unconsciously with attention. So make yourself even more comfortable. Allow what needs to happen to happen. To let go enough. So he said to her, go upstairs and make three piles. In the first pile, which will be the biggest, stack up everything you no longer need. Everything you can let go of. And everything that has burdened you, troubled you. And the second pile, which will be smaller, find everything that you can give away that may have value to someone else the treasures of stories, 
smiles. Old books and picture frames. And in the third pile, it shall be the smallest. Everything that you'll keep of great value to you. And as you go inside to do that, Allow your conscious mind and your conscious mind to drift off into another story while your unconscious now works for you as an act of will, an act of intention, while another part of you drifts comfortably off and out to one side to find a book of the many books of the many tales that if you let it can transform an aspect or more of who you are and that part of her drifted off. Not necessarily comfortably, but enough to find a story that resonated in some way to get the structure of a metaphor inside a book, a tale that opened quite nicely with the intention to transform not necessarily consciously but to be comfortable enough to allow the waves and themes of a tale that can change deepest foundations to bring a new type of fertility, a new and deeper understanding. And a long time ago, as it's written in a different land. There was a pantheon of gods and goddesses in ancient Greece where metaphors were more literal than story. And these were told as plays. And one of these story plays was about an incident that happened, an abduction. And who was abducted? Well, there was a very powerful goddess called Demeter. It was the goddess that brought the harvest, that brought the food, that made the earth bring forth its natural boons. And there was another very powerful god, one of the three of Zeus, Neptune, and Pluto. Pluto is the god of the underworld. This is a place where, metaphorically, spirits go after the many little deaths to somewhere else. And it's an interesting thing to talk about a life after death. But Hades, as the kingdoms of heaven and earth were split up, ended up being the keeper of the dark realm. A place where only a few could visit 
but it's really interesting that in this place something wakes up. But Hades was out, as people often do, on the lookout for a bid on the side. And that was participated by that naughty little imp Cupid, who shot Hades right through the heart with an arrow that made him have eyes for Demeter's daughter. His blood was up, the fire burst in his heart, and what any God does his kidnapper. And he kidnapped that young goddess's daughter and took her to the underworld against her will. And in the meantime, Demeter was very, very angry about the loss of her daughter. And she went out to find her as any good mother would. She went to look for what's important. And she looked here and looked there and didn't find her daughter. So she sat down by a well and wept. And while she was there, feeling sorrows, expressing loss, up comes a old farmer with a cart and his wife and their little daughter and says my dear what's wrong and the goddess said I've lost my daughter now be off with you go in peace off and the dog barked and ran round Demeter and the old man was very moved it's called compassion he said, I'm very sorry you've lost your daughter. Please come to our humble home. Come inside. We don't have much food. In fact, we've pretty much got nothing more than what we have on this cart. But please come and we'll share food and say a prayer to the gods and goddesses and the dancing pigeons for your daughter to come back safely. And the goddess was moved and went inside to a comfortable, warm, cozy little place. And it was little on the inside. It had all the comforts of home were there. There was a small hearth. And on that hearth they threw in some potatoes, a carrot, a little bit of onion maybe a parsnip, and boiled up a soup that was by no means fit for any goddess, but it was all they had. And the goddess was really moved by an act of generosity. And she inquired about her family, her history, where they'd come from. And as that conversation went on, Goddess Demeter found out that their youngest son was ill and dying in a bed in a cold room next door. And as a repayment for an unspecific act of kindness, she went next door and saw the young boy had real pain in his muscles. not comfortable but what she did was being a goddess she bent over and healed him and was in the process by covering him in ash and soot and placing him in a little fire to burn off his mortal flesh when the mother came in and screamed and interrupted the procedure and Demeter said oh with your kindness you've been so kind you've robbed your son of immortality but no matter I will teach this young man something something that will change the world I'll teach him about the plough and how to 
create and fashion ideas and thoughts that can change. And Demeter left the family and continued to look for her daughter Persephone and bumping into a wayward stream, a spirit, she discovered that her daughter had been kidnapped by Hades and dragged to the underworld. A place where spirits and energies transform into who knows what. And then she went to Zeus, the king of the gods, and demanded and asked for Zeus to go down to the underworld because no one else could go there. It's that forbidden place for Zeus to go down and free the daughter. And initially Hades refused. So out of spite, frustration, doing all she could, Demeter stopped everything growing on earth. Everything froze. The soil became barren. People started to starve. The land was restricted. And Zeus, fearing for people to worship him, went down to Hades and said she must come back as long as she has not eaten anything of the underworld because those rules are there once you consume in that place you can't come back and sadly she'd eaten the pomegranate she had to stay and the pomegranate's really interesting it's one of those forbidden fruits and you all know from our own history that there's certain fruits that you're told you shouldn't have. Certain appetites you can't fulfill. Just like um, when our friend, Adam, was tempted by a snake in the garden to eat of a fruit. That became the foundation of being cast out of heaven. A place where everyone, in some religions, some mythologies, has the right to be in this life, not in the life after. And it's interesting that a tree, a fruit, can cause so many things. You might not know it. But while a part of you continues to sort out into three piles, the things you no longer need, the things you might be able to give to someone else, and the things you want to keep, there's another part of you that can make connections, reprocess ideas, and begin to something else in a way that can benefit you to learn about structure and architecture too you can make notes and you can access what you need to access and not access what you don't can move around, you can stay still. And that pomegranate, that fruit, can be the fruit of the dead or the living. And one of the greatest dead civilizations is in Africa, in Egypt. And there's a very, very old saying. And this is the myth of Isis and Osiris. 
brother and sister. Now, the other brother and sisters are Seth and Neptus, polar opposites. And one of the things that happened in that pantheon was by accident. Osiris slept with his brother's wife. How terrible. And even worse, an issue came forth. This is Anubis, the jackal boy. And interestingly enough, there was a person very annoyed that this had happened. So Seth did something to make amends in the palace of the gods. He created a sarcophagus that were the exact measurements of Osiris. A bit like Cinderella's slipper. This is made to measure. And what he did was invited everyone to try out the sarcophagus to see who it would fit best, made to measure. And this was a trap. All of the birds of the Nile cocked and crowed. The assistants that were in on it smiled. Everyone tried the sarcophagus, but it only fit one person. And as soon as Osiris was in and trapped, that sarcophagus was sent off down the Nile. And in there, he died. And drifted, and drifted, and drifted. And came to rest on a bank in Syria. And from that, a tree grew up around him. So there you have the essence on the inside. Something that's dead, and yet can wake up. And who was to know? And in that country, the king and queen were really quite enamored with each other and very, very good rulers did something very special. Because that tree, the sarcophagus inside, with Osiris inside of that, that tree smelt so very sweet, so very special that even the cockerels cocked because it was so good and they pulled that inside of their palace and used it as a pillar for their bed and meanwhile Isis just like Demeter was looking for something they'd lost a long time ago she was looking for a counterpart the other part that made her who. And she came across, who knows, drawn to, activated, maybe just because she could. She found that tree with her dead husband inside at the palace. And she was invited in to become the maid to look after and care for the king and queen's little son and as she did she tended to that little person nurtured them made them comfortable provided different experiences and reminded that little guy that little gal on the inside that to become a master, you need to be able to learn from anything. And she decided, as goddesses do, to make that little fella immortal. Again, burning him in ethereal flame. And at this point, Mum and Dad came and said, what the hell are you doing burning our little kid? And the spell was broken. And she said, well, I'm a goddess. And I was going to make him a mortal, but you've screwed that up with your good intentions. 
I'll tell you what. I'll bless them and you will grow up really cool. By the way, um, my husband appears to be in your bed post. Can I have him? And the king and queen looked somewhat shocked and went, well, of course you can, pet. That explains the whole burning our son bit. So the king and queen returned the dead body in the sarcophagus to the queen. And she did something really interesting. She dragged that out, opened it, and lay on top of her dead husband and conceived. And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? And from this issue, the small god called Horus was born. And Horus is the son, the counterpart of the moon. One's all, and another is something else. You don't have light without dark. Lovers is to hate. To change. And from this little issue, Seth became furious. And he kind of dismembered the dead body, chopped it up, and took all of those parts away. Cast them to different places. And it took a great effort with Anubis. And Seth's wife to collect all of those parts. All 15 but one missing. And they were brought back together. Something that had been dismembered. And the ceremony involved a resurrection of an energy. The waking up of a power. You are yesterday. You are today, and you are tomorrow. You have the power to be born a second time. You are the energies of all the gods, all the demons. This is it. And at that point, this is when Osiris became the lord of the underworld. His son Horus battled Seth, the forces of light and good, the Jedi's and the Sith. And in that, when pharaohs now take on that power, there's a secret. Seth lost a testicle and Horus an eye, the same way Odin gave his eye for the wisdom that to see into a future and the past. And there's a big secret that only the pharaohs knew. Because the tale of a battle, like those Asgardians, between the giants and the forces of good and evil, there's a secret to that. And only the pharaohs knew that even though those two parts need to go out and leave those two parts battled and fought the greatest secret is that they are all of the same energy they exist because of each other there's no wolves to feed there's no wolves to starve and that secret is only for you to transform because you need to be willing to learn in each and every situation. So Demeter, again with the mighty Zeus asks, is there no way you can bring my daughter back? And he visits Hades. And Hades says she's eaten three pomegranate seeds. 
she can't come back. And Zeus says, yeah, but she has to come back now because Demeter has made the earth barren. The plants no longer grow. The rivers have stopped. And all is dying. So she has to come back. And the bargain has struck that she can come back for half of the year. Every six months, the sun, the summer comes back. And then <coughs> for another six months, the sun recedes. The cold comes. And winter's here. And by those opposites, you get to a place where you can allow what's happening to happen and enjoy a human existence your true ability <laughs> indeed welcome to enjoy the ability to appreciate opposites compliments because to neglect one buries something and to resurrect another. Allow these energies to wake up anew. So Zeus broke at a wonderful deal that allowed the earth to have cycles, opposites, and remembering a deep secret that only you know allowed something to come back into this earth to be born again and you can stare and wonder as things change as seasons come and go as ideas form and it's a beautiful thing to have a fully human life is it not so she started to consider having been upstairs in that room for a long time or was it just a minute to sort out into three piles what she'd leave what she'd give away and what she'd keep and it's nice to know that said the master architect that some time had passed. The trees outside have grown a little. The winds breezed somewhat. And those cockerels have crowed. And he said to the students who were considering what they're considering, the next time I saw her, it was real interesting. Because I saw her in town. And it was some time after she changed perceptions, perspectives. And was doing something else that was even more fulfilling, even more rich for her. But we did breeze past that old building, that old library. And she said it's really interesting how those people organize their books in a different way. How the maps have changed. And they really do have a different system. And it was those pronouns the master architect said that allowed me to know that she really had let go of that part of her history or her history and to move on because there's a great many experiences 
new chapters to write in words, stories and images of your own experience, your own developing life. And as you discover yourself, the chapters and the stories and the experiences that now you can really be willing to learn from any situation that you can know more about building clearing and organizing a great many things in ways that you can discover yourself benefiting others doing more of what you want to do giving birth to the most beautiful forms shapes and experiences and enjoy the opposites experience the dark and the light be open to the concrete literal, the fairy tales, and the deeper meanings of your own relationships that you foster and sponsor. And not everyone, said the architect, will become an architect. just happens to be my path. You can choose your own path and open up the stories, the myths, the ideas and relationships. You choose. Enjoy the dark places enjoy the light as you wake up and you can wake up and of course you can metaphorically be born a second time after all Cliff Richard did didn't he born again Christian wonderful but what does that mean to be born again does it mean to transform in some way to move through a series of personal developments. Ha! Wah! Fwah! Fwah! Hmm! Ha! Hmm! So here we all are. And here we are. What a fantastic place to be. Alive, bearded, moustached, clean shaven. Wonderful. Hmm! Are we all back? Did you ever leave? Have you been and gone? How nice, how wonderful. Are you okay? 